you do not know what to say. The best thing is to just breathe. <laughs> there was a time when I thought that unless you are completely prepared, you do not go in front of people. And from that place, I started over preparing. I was like, I have to know ten times more than the people who come and who come to listen to me. And why did I have that over preparation? It was coming from a place of fear. I was scared. And because of my fear, I over prepared for that event. And what was my fear about? The fear that people will come to know that I am not good enough, I am not knowledgeable enough, I am not competent enough, I am not, uh, I am not someone who should be looked upon to guide others. That was my fear. That they will come to know my shallowness. They will come to know that about all my failures. They will come to know about all my incompetences. That was a fear that drove me into over preparing and I didn't know how to relax. Today it's opposite. I never prepare and I am relaxed not knowing what I have to say. And I just noticed what right now is happening to me and that's what I am sharing to start this whole conversation. Because it is not really about how much you know in life. It is really not about how well prepared you are for life. It is really not about how competent you are. It is really not about how much you have achieved in the past. Because every moment is fresh, every moment is new and unless you allow the moment to guide you, the moment to tell you what to say, you are kind of doing nothing but what is known as copy paste. You are blabbering from your memory, you are blabbering from your everything that you have said in the past and you are repeating yourself. But that's also what we all do in life. We keep repeating ourselves. But life comes every moment in a new way to us. And in its new way it is inviting that wait. Let me tell you what you should say, what you should do, what you should be. But how can that happen? The first thing, what are you scared of? Find out. You are scared of being rejected. And what does that mean? That no one will love you. Because fundamentally what is everyone seeking? Only love and nothing but love. There is nothing else a human seeks. And because love is not available, because love is not in the realm of our experience, we try to substitute it with certain who 
poor substitutes of love. And what is this poor substitute of love? First, appreciation, acknowledgement, approval. And you are wanting all these things in life to be accepted. You want to be accepted by others. You want to be approved by others. You want to be acknowledged by others. Imagine a scenario. You go out of your house. People don't look at you. You say hi. They don't return back that hi. And what is it that is happening? You are being ignored. And as you are being ignored, you will feel a huge pain coming up in you. What is that pain that you will feel? It is the pain of rejection. But what does it mean practically? It practically means that people are not acknowledging your presence. So being ignored is the greatest not greatest, but a big pain that we have. And we don't want to be ignored. We want people to look at us. We want people to acknowledge us. We want people to say us hi. We want people to say us good morning. We want people to say how was your day. Not because it really matters what the question is. What matters is they looked at you. They saw you. They acknowledge your presence. This is the poor substitute of love. But what truly is love? Is it really romantic? Is it really about a person saying I love you? No, this love is really much deeper. And what this love really means is I accept you the way you are. I allow you the way you are. A love where there is no judgment, no one is judging you. A love where that person respects you for who you are and not for what you are. What is the difference between who you are and what you are? What you are is like you became a successful student. You got 98% or you became you excelled in the sports or you excelled in your music that is what you are but who you are is without your achievements without your failures and both are included and you are being accepted for all that So when someone accepts you unconditionally, that is what is love. Unfortunately, humans do not have the capacity to unconditionally accept others. Why? Because they could not unconditionally accept themselves. In order to accept unconditionally others, you have to first have accept yourself unconditionally. But you say that I will accept myself unconditionally only when someone says I am good. Otherwise I will not accept. Only when someone acknowledges that I have some, done something great. Otherwise I will not accept. Now you are seeking others approval before you accept yourself. Unfortunately most of the time this approval is not going to come and you will be left in a place of non-approval. So you couldn't love yourself. Then the question comes that I have a series of failure in my life. Well, you also had series of success but unfortunately the very nature of the mind is it remembers only the negative things and nothing but the negative things. You will remember all your failures in life. You will hardly remember all your success. And that is the reason why you treasure your trophies and certificates so much. Because you want to put them on a wall, on a cupboard, in order to remind that there was a day I was successful. 
but you never need a certificate and a symbol outside of you to remember how many failures you have had in life. So at the very nature of mind it is it remembers every failure. It remembers everything for which you have judged yourself. And the very nature of the mind is it never forgives. And because you don't forgive yourself, you cannot, you are not being able to accept yourself. And because you cannot accept yourself, you cannot love yourself. And because you don't love yourself, you also cannot love others. So why it is good to come to the college and go through the learning, learning of what we call is a set of information, a set of skills, a set of uh, capacity to think, capacity to process knowledge, process information, a capacity to recreate from them, a capacity to uh, teach others, a capacity to process things and go beyond what we call as thinking out of the box. Those things are very beautiful and they are needed. One needs to excel, excel. One needs to go beyond one's comfort zone. But that's one part of life, one aspect of life. And this aspect of life is the years and years of training. You start from your kindergarten and you come up to your college and sometimes you go into your post-graduation. Years and years of training. But forgiving yourself hardly takes any time. If you truly have the access to complete that. So I had learned the art of forgiving myself in many ways. Because you can do that in many ways. You can do that intellectually. How do you do that intellectually? You actually reason that person had certain compulsions because of which that person acted in that way. And you tell yourself it's okay whatever he did. I forgive him and I move on. Or I didn't know what to do truly. I forgive myself and I move on. That's doing it intellectually. You can do it energetically. Energetically how you do it? Now when you don't forgive yourself, certain energies get stuck in your body. And there are certain modalities which teach you how to free those energies that are stuck. And then if you know how to unstuck them, those energies again start moving and you have forgiven yourself. The other thing that you can forgive yourself is through your heart center. And in the heart center it's about you feel a deep compassion for that other person or for your own self. And in that compassion you say, it's okay. We all make mistakes and let's move on. So you can come from the mind, you, come, you can come from the energy, you can come from the heart. I had learned all these methods. I used them because I was a healer. But one day I came to know God. Knowing God was something very interesting. He came to me. I was neither religious, I was neither spiritual. And so God had no place in my life. That it was just a word that I found others. They were like 
the way you keep kicking your football, <coughs> people keep on kicking that word God. How do they keep kick, kicking the word, uh, that word? They say, my word, my God is better than your God. My God is greater than your God. That's how they keep on kicking that word God. And in the name of God, they do all kind of things. So I had seen that. So I was like, I don't really care for this word or whatever that stands for. But this one came, this one said, you have to work for me. And what work was there is another story which I am not going to hear. But I made one agreement. This, this one who came didn't have any interest in the humans. This one had interest in someone else. But I said, listen, whatsoever your agenda is, I have no interest in that. I have my agenda. I am a human. I need something for the humans if I am to work for you. Now, I was a businessman by profession. I knew how to negotiate. I knew how to make deals. And so I made a deal with God. I know nothing is free in this universe. So why give something free to God? Let's extract something. So you can understand that by the way I am speaking, for me God is not conceptual. God is not a hallucination. God is not a delusion. God is not a philosophy. God is not an assumption. I am dealing with a real being in real time, real space. <coughs> and so my thing, my, what I wanted was only one thing. I want humans for, a uh, healing for the humans, unlike all the healings that I had learned. I was a master healer. So I said, it has to be better than all that things that I know. It has to be better than everything that is in this domain. Because God was, God never lives in this domain. God never was in this domain. God has no interest in this domain. And when I speak of in this domain, I mean the multiverse. <coughs> and by the way, science and technology was my bread and butter. So I'm, I was not someone who is a theosophist or philosophist. I am a very practical person. So I dealt with a practical <coughs> entity, I demanded a practical payoff and with that we, we made this trade agreement and then the game started, a game that lasted for 8 or 8 years before I completed that assignment that he had for me. And when that assignment was over, which completed in August 2023, then started a new journey. And that new journey was about that it's now for bringing God to the humans. I hardly brought, brought God to the humans because I was working with a very close-knit group, a very core group, in order to complete that assignment that God had given me. But this time, it was time now to go out into the world. But I had to go out with certain tools. Because I wasn't going to give the people any teachings. I wasn't going to give them any moral or ethical things. I wasn't going to tell them what to do and what not to do. I, was, I wanted to give them which is very simple and yet something that delivers. It's like a scientist mindset. We don't deal with abstract things here. We deal with things that is verifiable. For me, 
God is the utility, not someone to revel, not someone to have any devotion towards, not someone to have faith in, not someone whom you trust because you do not know him. Why should you trust him? As far as I am, I was concerned he could have been the devil. So it took me five years to really know that he is God before I said, okay, finally I accept you. Why did it take five years? Because for five years I was experiencing and exploring everything that is not God in the unseen world, in the upper worlds and in the lower worlds. How could I do it? It is only because of the gift that God gave me that I could talk with anyone and everyone, everyone whom you worship, everyone whom you revere, everyone towards whom you have devotion. For me, they were just individuals. And I know them in and out. <laughs> and I know one thing, they are not what you think they are. But that is not what I am going here into because that's a separate discussion. I'm here for you and unless you have something which is very practical and something which you can utilize into your day-to-day -day life, my coming here is like giving you a sermon. So I don't want to be a preacher. There are many preachers. Let them preach you. So what is it that I have practically for you? What I have practically for you is a book. <coughs> the contents of the book could be very controversial and you might find very difficult to accept or digest. And the book clearly says, and God clearly says, I understand, you humans will not be able to accept it. So the contents are not important. You want to read it, you can read it. It's up to you. What is important is the book itself. The energy of the book, the grace of the book. And what is this book about? It's a book of healing. Just talk to the book. Say all your fear, all your pain, all your trauma, all your negativity. Say everything for which you couldn't forgive yourself. Say everything for which you couldn't forgive others. Say everything because of which you find your day-to-day -day living very tiresome, very painful. Because I know in the human domain so much bad things are happening. Not all of them are physical, but much of it is psychological emotional because I know the rejections through which the child grows up. I know how parents are incompetent in delivering what they should deliver as a parent. I know the fights that happens between the siblings. I know the pressure the child goes through in the school. I know the rejections the child faces with the peer group. I know the domination and manipulation the child goes through and as it becomes an adult, everything remains. It's just that as an adult you have more coping mechanisms. As a child you did not have those coping mechanisms. But just because you have this coping mechanism doesn't mean that they are not with you they still run your life. The fear of rejection still runs your life. The fear of not being good enough still runs your life. The fear of unworthy, the, the feelings of unworthiness still runs your life. The feelings that I don't deserve the best of life still runs your life. And because of this, 
so many of you are sabotaging your life. So many of you are wanting to punish yourself. Why do you want to punish yourself? Because as a child, every time you made a mistake, your parents punished you. But now you have grown up. And the parent is not around. But you take on the role of the parent and you start punishing yourself. How do you punish yourself? You cause an accident, break your leg. You lose your money. You invite people who come and betray you. You fall down. So sometimes the punishment is physical. Sometimes the punishment is psychological. But it is always there. You lose your precious things. It's a punishment. So these are the ways you punish yourself. Earlier when I used to conduct classes, I used to tell the people that you know why accidents happen? The first reason accidents happen is because you are angry on yourself. You want to beat yourself up. But now you don't use that slap and stick which your parents used. What you go do is you go and bang or invite someone to bang on you. And now you are having pain, you have a broken leg, broken hand or whatever. This is one way you why accidents happen. The second reason why accidents happen is because you want to escape certain responsibilities of life, but you cannot do that in a rational way. So you ensure that your movement is restricted. You ensure that you fall, you get a broken leg. That's one reason. Now you can tell everybody, listen, I promised you that, that I will do that. But I'm so sorry, I am now on the bed with a plaster, with a bandage. And the other person cannot say anything. But you have, avoid, but you have avoided being responsible for what you said you will do. This is another reason why accidents happen. Another reason why accidents happen is generally this happens for the old people. Now these are the people who don't get attention. But the moment they sleep in the bathroom and they have a twisted ankle or a broken leg or a broken hand, suddenly the whole family starts coming around. Now they get a lot of attention. And they don't mind bearing the pain because it gives them the attention of all the family. And if there is no family even to get attention, they are admitted to the hospital. The nurses are giving them attention. The doctor is giving them attention. This is how the subconscious mind works. And there are other reasons for which accidents happen, which I will not go into because <coughs> we don't have that much time into all these things. I think I have spoken for half an hour. I think I should take questions now. <laughs> so because I will speak in what is relevant for you rather, me, rather than me blabbering around. So you can ask me questions. Uh, students, you are free to ask any questions that you feel like. Please uh, introduce yourself. From Parker Guru from Hello, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for your valuable speech. And uh, I am I have a question. I'm from the I'm the Parker Guru from Political Science. I have a question. What is life according to you? And the second question is that 
uh, sometimes we forget to thank you to God. We can't be gratitude grateful all the time. So should it, uh, would it be very possible that we should be grateful to all the time that thank you God for everything that you have given to us? This is my question to you. Okay. Now I have a very short memory. What was the first question? What is, what life, is the life according to you? What is life according to me? Okay. Uh, I had this question, but I had this question in a much more precise way. And you must understand about a question. Until and unless your question is very precise, the answers will not be so good. So make sure that your question has total clarity, total precision and yet it is concise. Okay, three things. Total clarity, total precision and yet it is concise. Now instead of having it in that way that what is life, my question that I had was, what is the meaning and purpose of life? I knew I was born, I know the humans were born. But exactly what is the meaning and purpose of life? Why? Now, um, so this question drove me. It drove me for many years and because this is a philosophical question, it's not really a practical question, because this is a philosophical question, it took me into philosophy, it took me into theosophy, it took me into spiritual domain and it took me into the religious domain. I explored everything. But I have one gift. I really don't read everything. I go through them in such a way that I come to know what truly they are trying to say. Because I know most of the time a thick book ultimately is only going to say only three or four lines. So I am like trying to find out what truly are they wanting to say. So I was able to go through the whole gamut of everything that was ever written about life and I found out there are many versions, many answers. And if there are so many answers, so many versions, that means one truly doesn't know what is the meaning and purpose of life. Because if, if a question has an answer, there should be only one answer. But others will say, no, 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 there should be 10 answers, 20 answers. Well, if there are 10 answers and 20 answers, that means one is assuming. That means one is creating all kind of hypothesis. One doesn't know. So I wasn't interested in hypothesis. But all I got was a series of hypotheses. And then I said, fine. I stopped my journey of exploration and then something happened. And what happened was, <clears throat> I was passing by the mosque, one mosque and the azan was going on and when the azan started, it hit me hard. And I lost my conscious awareness. I was on a scooter in the middle of thick traffic I was returning back home. I lost my conscious awareness. I kept on driving. I reached my home. I covered a distance of 12 kilometers through very thick traffic without knowing what I was doing. And only when I was parking the scooter, my awareness returned. And then I'm like, how did I come so far without really knowing what I was doing? Anyway, it was just an experience, did not give it much of a thought. But because at that point of time something happened. And something happened was that a clarity emerged. 
what is this clarity is what I am going to share with you. The clarity that emerged was about, not about life, but about what it means to be responsible in your life. And what does it mean about being responsible? And what I got that there were five levels that was downloaded in me. I call it downloaded because I felt it being downloaded. I couldn't bring it into my conscious awareness, everything that got downloaded, but eventually I was able to bring. The first level of awareness that I got was, you are responsible for whatever is happening to me. This is the, the mind of the victim. A victim always points, tells to the parents, because of you I am having all these problems. It tells to everyone around them, you made, made my life miserable. The spouse says to the husband, you made my life miserable. The student says to their teachers, you made my life miserable. This is the victims of life. Then one has a little more realization and then comes the understanding, no, we are responsible. What does this we mean? Now there is a feeling, no, I have also contributed something to my misery. And it is not just the other person, I also contributed, I also did these things, I also thought like this. So I am also responsible. So this is, we are responsible. Then came the third thing, third realization. What is the third realization? The third realization is only I am responsible, no one else. From where does this realization come? This realization comes from the place of, I now realize that what the others did was not why I am miserable so much. I am miserable so much because I created the misery within me. I resisted what others did. I could not forgive what others did. And everything is nothing but an experience of life. What others did is only an event of life. An event of life does not make you miserable, does not create your suffering, we create our suffering because of the way we look at the events of life. This is the third level of realization. And then came the fourth level of realization. This fourth level of realization says nobody is responsible. Because at that point of time you realize that events are happening on their own way. Even I am even not contributing to the events. And the thoughts and feelings that are coming in me are not being created by me, but they just pop up. And I don't know from where they are coming. I don't know who puts them into me. I don't know why I become happy when I become happy. I don't know why I become miserable why when I become miserable. There is something outside of me which is playing all these games. This realization brings in the understanding that no human is responsible for their suffering. And then came the final realization. And what is the final realization? The final realization was it's all a dream nothing ever happened. Because when you look at your dreams, they pop up. Who created them? They are as real as your real world. And you go through them experientially, emotionally, psychologically, exactly the way you live in your real world. And that world, world is as solid as your this world. But when you wake up, nothing ever happened. It was all a dream. And so you realize this life also is a dream that is happening. Nothing truly is happening. 
It's just that they appear in our perception and we play with those perceptions. So these are the five levels of realization. And in these five levels of realization, I realized life is empty and meaningless. You ask me what is life? That was my realization that life is empty and meaningless. Inherently. But Pradeep's life is important and full of meaning. And as long as my self-importance remains, life is full of meaning and full of purpose. The importance drops, life becomes empty and meaningless. Thank you. Any other questions? Hello sir, my name is Hello. Hello. So sir, since we are talking about God, can I ask you a question regarding religion? Yeah, what, what is exactly the question? Because I don't know what to answer. Okay, so uh, since, uh, so suppose let's assume that my friend is, is, is from Islam, I'm from Hindu, he's from Christian, and he's from uh, Buddhism. So when we die, like, uh, are we, we, do we all have our different heavens, or one of three guys going to heaven? <laughs> <laughs> that is your question? Yes, sir. Like, this question has been in my head since I was a child. Okay. <laughs> You see, in your questions, or in your question, you are concerned about heaven and hell. But in my journey, I went beyond heaven and hell. You have to understand first thing what happens after you die, before you, this question can be understood. Am I permitted to go into the realm after death? Okay. <clears throat> you have to understand something more before you understand what I am trying to say. Have you all seen in a YouTube video that when someone is dying, there is a shadowy figure emerging out of the physical body, floating. Some of you have seen. And some assume that to be the soul. Okay? Or some really don't know what it is, but some say that is the soul, well, that is not the soul. We have certain energy bodies. And now, I'll tell you a little bit about spirituality and then I'll come to that part. We have different energy bodies. Uh, there's the, the first body that we have is the astral body, first energy body. The second energy body that we have is known as the mental energy body. And the third energy body that we have is known as the etheric energy body. I'm not going beyond that. I'm only restricting myself into the three. Now, when you see that shadowy figure flowing above from the physical body after death, it is basically a combination of these three energy bodies. It is not the soul. No one can see the soul. Now, <clears throat> what happens to these three energy bodies? The first one, which is the astral energy body, is meant to complete the life review process and then subsequently go into the a world which is known as the ancestral world which we know as also as Pitrulok. So it goes there. This thing called the mental energy body is supposed to hold that whole karmic imprint baggage or whatever you want to call it 
and from that is created the next incarnation. Now whether you believe in incarnation, reincarnation or not is not the debate. But the point is yes, people do reincarnate. And this karmic baggage creates the story of the next life. <coughs> And this mental energy body gets transplanted into that human. And that human is given a new astral energy body. And then there is the third energy body which remains with the human for about two weeks approximately. And in this two weeks if you are uh, sensitive you can feel the presence of that person in the room around you or maybe sitting in that chair which was very favorite or whatever that be. You can feel their presence if you have that sensitivity. But they generally remain for max two weeks and then they leave. Now if this astral energy body doesn't get stuck and doesn't go to the ancestral world then they become what is known as ghosts okay which means they are now lingering lingering in a place where they are not supposed to linger they did not complete their journey why are they lingering because of their uh, attachments they are attached to the humans, they are attached to the property, they are attached to the bank balance, they are attached to their business, they are attached to their land, they are attached to the, the if they are running an NGO, they are attached to their NGO or whatever that whole thing that they are being. Their attachment keeps them hanging, they are neither here nor there. And then they try to enter into humans' bodies and try to fulfill their desires. With this background, coming now to your question, what happens when we die? Are we going to heaven? Will the Buddhist and the Islam and the Muslim and the uh, Christian go to the heaven? Because in some religion there is heaven, in some religions they don't talk about heaven. So when they don't talk about heaven, will they go? Well, what is the definition of heaven first of all? The definition of heaven is that you will have what you want to have. Okay? So if you want to have woman, you will have lots of women. If you want to have a bar where you can drink, you can have lots of bars. If you want to have uh, nature where you want to just roam around, you can have very beautiful nature. If you want to have, uh, if you are scientific mind and you want to do all kind of research, you can go and do all kind of research in the astral world. Those are known as astral worlds. That is heaven. Heaven is not same for everyone. Depending on what you, what you wanted in life, but could not create, could not experience, and now you are wanting to go there and experience that. So heaven just means you can have whatever you want. That's heaven. There is no such thing as the heaven. And every human creates their own heaven. And yes, a Buddhist also will create, a Muslim also will create, a Christian also will create. Okay? Thank you. We have time for one last question, if there is anyone. Hmm. Okay, uh, we have so one of our faculties who wants to ask. Okay, them. yes. <coughs> Hello, sir. my name is Musa, I'm from Google yes. Science Department. Uh, very interesting talk and a very good round of questions and answers. Sir, you didn't mention about your God. You also mentioned regarding the who you are and the difference in who and what. So, I feel it might be a personal question, so it's up to you if you want to answer. So, what are the changes that you felt before your journey and after your journey? 
before my journey with God and after yes. my journey with yes. God? Yes. What are the revelations? And also, what is God according to you? You didn't define God according to you. Thank you. I'll tell you what is God according to God, not according to me. Okay? And everything in my book is, nothing in that book is according to me. It is all according to God. Basically, the information I wrote in the book, I cannot even comprehend having those informations. No human can comprehend having those informations. But that is another matter. You want to know my journey as a human, coming up to God and then beyond God. Is it like that? So logistically speaking, I grew in a family who never gave me any God. They never took me into any temple. They never <coughs> made me worship. And I am so blessed, they gave me no baggage in terms of religion, in terms of spirituality, in terms of any conditioning. This is the best gift my parents have given me. Because if you don't give anyone these things, you never initiate anyone into any religion till they are an adult. No one ever will become religious. In order to make a person religious, you have to initiate them when they are young, when they are a child. You have to drag them to the temple, you have to drag them to the mosque, you have to drag them to the church. But my parents didn't do and then when I came to my senses, well, I, no one in their right senses would want to go into any religion. That being so, my life basically was about truly making some money because we came from a very low place and uh, so some, some comfort I wanted because of which went into business after some hiccups it clicked, it flourished, had some comfort in life. <coughs> so, so I have a journey and insights around being in business which I don't come into. Then, uh, then I came into that uh, journey of what is, what is the meaning and purpose of life that I shared with you, the realization. Then I came into, well if life is empty and meaningless, what is left to do? So what is left to do is like learn the modalities of healing. Because if I have a headache, I want to be free from my headache as fast as I can. And basically I did not like medicines. So I did not want medicines in my, I didn't want any medicine to go into my body. So I loved learning healing. And that was a long journey about learning all kind of healings. But as I was learning all kind of healings, at some point I found I started teaching also subsequently, but I found I was teaching others modalities. So one day I said to the universe that if anyone is listening to me, I want my own modality. And then someone came and gave me the modality. I took first, first I practiced on myself, I saw yeah, it's much better than what I had earlier. Because when I ask from someone anything, I am very specific in the way I ask. So it's not very vague. They have to deliver within a very uh, particular framework. <coughs> so when I did the first class with that modality, and then as I completed the class, there was a lady who came and said, was Shiva in this room? I looked at her and I said, yes. Because the one who came and gave me that modality was Shiva. And then a whole journey started which lasted for many years. And during this journey, many deities would come. They would say, okay, now teach my stuff. And I would take on the new modality. I would teach their stuff. But it was always about stuff is yours, results should be within my expectations. So this kept on happening. Now I started talking with the deities. I started chit-chatting, gossiping, all these things. 
and even the masters came, the Sai Baba, Mahavatar, Baba Ji, and there were others. So it's all a journey in itself. <coughs> and then one day, no one came. I couldn't connect with anyone. The question is, what was I up to this point? Now, what I was up to this point, and since I started my journey as a teenager, I always felt I never belonged to any human. I was always very introvert. I was always very shy. I did not like making friends. My only friends were books. From that place, I started moving. Coming into business, I was forced to interact with people. It was very struggle for me. Coming into the healing world, I really healed a lot of my wounds, lot of my trauma, lot of my pain. Coming into the teaching of the healing modalities, I learned the art of being with people. I mastered the fear of people rejecting me. Not mastered, but I actually released on that fear. And then I was able to relax with the people as I was with people. So that is where I was up till that point of time. Which means I was someone who did not want anything from life. I had no wants, no desires, no nothing. I was waiting for death to happen. That does not mean I was in depression. I was fully enjoying life. But I didn't want anything. And so when God came and said, you have to work for me, I did ask for something, but in that something there was nothing for me. It was for humanity. Because I had no needs. And that also became a great strength for me in this work. Because there were those who also came who were against God. And then they said, we will give you anything that you want and beyond your imagination and not only in this world but also in the other worlds just don't work for God and because I didn't want anything because I had no desires I just said thank you I already have made my commitment and once I commit I don't fall back it doesn't matter what price I have to pay and I tell you, I destroyed my family in that commitment. They were not very graceful to me. <clears throat> and God wouldn't protect me. Because God said, if you want to work for me, I'll give you nothing. Not even protection. It's up to you. You want to work, you don't work. But something told me, here was something that I need to explore and I am an explorer I am not a man of faith I am not a man of devotion I am not a man who trusts other people and other entities but I am an explorer I have a scientific mindset I don't reject anything but I don't accept anything either and from there I started this journey, it lasted 8 years and in this 8 years God showed me or told me everything about the upper worlds, lower worlds It told me about the game that's happening and I found, my God, it's a huge game of deception It blew me out, that whole deceptions and I found out we humans really have no choice the humans really have no will. And more I found out and it kind of blew me apart as to what world are we living in. But anyway, the things were to be that. And so I completed my journey. I, I brought in some of the material of those eight years that I received into my book. It's only a portion of it. 
that itself is disturbing. <clears throat> but the book is not about what is in the book. The book is about, it is a book of healing. You kind of hold on to this book and just say, I am so angry, I am so angry with myself, I am so angry with that person. <clears throat> so if, if this is the book, so all you do is just hold this like this and just say, I am so angry. I feel so sad. I am miserable. Anything that is disturbing you, tormenting you, creating all kind of mental, emotional unrest, just talk to the book. Talk to the book every day for one minute, two minutes. Put it aside. No need to read it. Because reading is not going to give you anything. It just will quench your thirst intellectual thirst. Do it for 30 days. You will be amazed at what will show up in your life. The healing that will happen. And 10,000 books have gone out already among the humans and they have said it's a miracle this book. But when I say miracle, let me also warn you. Nothing will change in your life, but a lot will change. It's all your internal experience of your life will change. I am not saying people will become nice to you. I am not saying money will shower on you. I am not saying you will have a promotion or you will score 98 out of 100. I am not saying all these things. But the quality of your living will alter. You will become relaxed, calm, peaceful. So I am not giving you any religion in the name of God. I know what religion is. The less I talk about it, the better it is. I wouldn't give you that. I am giving you a tool. And this tool connects you with God. I did not go into what is not God. It's in this book you can read. So have this book. It will be in your library. You don't even need to purchase it. Whenever you are not okay, go to the library, take out the book, talk with it for one minute, return it back. Whenever again you are upset, come to your library, talk with the book for one minute, return it back. 30 days and you will see what shows up in your life. It will be so nice, but it will be very subtle. I have used this book, this material. I have used God as a utility. I don't revel God. I don't put God on a pedestal. I don't worship God. Neither I want you to worship. If you want to worship, you are enough gods. Go and worship. I wouldn't give you a God to worship. Thank you.